Hi there, I'm Eldridge Misnomer, and uh, this is a game I made for the Gothic Novel Jam uh, in July of 2018. I'm going to play through it today. Um, it's a narrative game, so that means I'll be reading a bunch of text, uh, and there'll be lots of spoilers. So if you want to play it before I play through it, I suggest you do that before I start. It's got um, a lot of branches in it and a lot of optional bits and so even if you do watch this through you'll probably only see about uh, a quarter or so maybe even less of the of the story so feel free to play it again. It's just recently been brought to my attention that although the game has been up and available um, for a while uh, the files that I uploaded were not working. The, the zip file didn't have all of the data in it. Um, so if you've tried to download and play it and failed, have another go now because uh, I think I've fixed all that. And I won't be talking a bunch about how I made it and stuff. Uh, this time I'll just play through it. Um, I will try and do that in another video soon. Um, so, here we are as the glow brings out the haze. I'm going to turn the music up, but not too loud. Uh, and probably the text be down a bit as I'm reading. Okay, I think those levels are okay. Maybe the music down a bit more. You descend the stairs slowly, nightgown fluttering at your ankles, bare feet noiseless on the carpet. You're halfway down before Septimus notices you. He starts. Darling, you're out of bed. Say nothing. You continue down. Septimus seems agitated. His face is pale grey and the soft moonlight striped across the hall. Darling? Darling? Sophia? You move past him, gliding towards the library. You've come over all queer, my love. Some dreamt terror has overcome you. Septimus seizes your shoulder gently, tries to divert your course. Brush him off. But you slip out from under his touch and continue towards the library door. Sophia, darling, why are you going to the library? Come to your senses, Sophia. You push open the hardwood door to the library. Moonlight strained through the wind, troubled branches of the magnolia outside, flickers across the shelves and their leather bound tomes. Look round. Resting on the desk, directly before you, lies a single sheet of paper, stained and dog eared. Septimus pushes past you and snatches up the paper. You needn't concern yourself with that, my love. It's just some worthless scrap. Ask him about the paper. Septimus looks frightful, his face grey and hollow, his arms crossed tightly across his chest, trapping the paper to his bosom. What does it say, Septimus? It's nothing, nothing, nothing to trouble yourself with. Insist. Tell me. He sags, the will gone out from him. The page slips from his arms to the floor and his limp body slips with it onto the divan behind him, like grey silk slipping from your sewing table to the floor. Collect the paper. You bend and pick up the paper and sit at the desk to read it. A spidery line of faded, rust-coloured ink meanders across the page, covering every square inch of it. You hunch over and squint to make out the writing, which is far too unruly to be Septimus's. It's a letter. Read the letter. Dearest Uncle, I must recount to you these most unnatural occurrences. 
I was going out of my residence yesterday, intending to attend evening mass, when I saw, standing in the pool of sepulchral light from a fizzling gas lamp, an ugly little man with a peculiar foreign cast. He stepped from the light and addressed himself to me, speaking with the barest hint of an accent. Child, it is imperative that we exchange words. Will you come with me? I thought him some crazed lunatic, absconded from the Bethlehem Hospital, Bethlehem Hospital, and so paid him no heed at all and went on my way. Behind me, the strange dark man shouted in a twisted foreign tongue. I understood not, nor would I have wanted to. Hasten to the church. Upon arriving at the church, I was shocked to find it empty. Not a soul was there. Look for someone. Eventually, I found my way to the crypt, and there, in a corner, was the sexton, curled up in a ball, dribbling down his front, eyes glazed over, murmuring to himself. Shake him to his senses. I gave him a few vigorous jolts, and before long, some of his faculties had returned, and I was able to coax from him his tale. I was conducting a little research on a great hoard of Mesopotamian tile fragments in the Ashmolean when I found, in amongst the shards, a miscategorized object most certainly not from the fertile crescent. It was, to even the untrained eye, dull, plain, unworthy of an antiquarian's curiosity. And yet, to me, it exuded a peculiar attraction, a sort of sub-luminary glow. I was drawn to it. Take it. I'm ashamed to admit that my base instinct got the better of me, and without thinking, I pocketed it. As I did so, I felt a lightness come over me. A relief. And I immediately justified my act. It didn't belong, but... It didn't belong with those other fragments, and was certainly of no interest to any true student of the past. Go home. I took the artifact home, where, overcome by a sudden wave of shame, I squirrelled it away in a drawer and did my best to forget about it. That same night, the whole household was roused by the sound of Oscar, my youngest child, wailing. The little one was not in his crib, but, after a panicked but mercifully brief search, was soon found in the drawing room, curled up on a rug by the still warm hearth, sobbing. As his nurse returned him to bed, she found that his little fingers were clutched tightly into a ball, which, try as she might, she could not coax apart. To bed. We made sure that he was tucked up tight, and Nurse agreed to watch over him. But come morning, his state had not improved. His whole body was drenched in sweat, and where his fingers were clutched tight, the skin was growing hard and grey. He seemed still to be sleeping, but under his breath muttered ceaseless nonsense. My wife, Patience, wanted to send for a doctor post-haste. I myself felt that someone with knowledge of the arcane might be more appropriate. Call for an occult expert. And it so happened that I knew of just such a man, a professor, an antiquarian by the name of Marsh, who was staying in the village to investigate a just-discovered ancient burrow nearby. Send for Marsh. I sent a boy to his lodgings to fetch him, and the two arrived back in good time. I rewarded the boy with a bright silver penny and ushered March in to see my son. He insisted immediately that we darken the room and then removed from his bag a small brazier which he placed near Oscar and a bundle of dry herbs which he lit on the brazier. They filled the room with noxious fumes which made the eyes water and the lungs rasp. Marsh pulled on a pair of leather gloves and, taking Oscar's wrist delicately in his hand, examined his fist without ever touching it. After a few moments peering, he straightened up, peeled off his gloves and beckoned me into a corner. Sir, I must ask you a question or two, and if you love your son and desire his recovery, I must urge you to honesty. 
reply. Of course. Tell me then, sir, have you not recently visited the Ashmolean? Why, yes, yes I have. And is it not the case that, when you came away from there, you were perhaps a little more heavily laden than when you had arrived? Well, yes, I confess that is so. Then let me tell you, sir, that you have been most unwise, for that object that you took is not unknown to my brethren and I. Indeed, it has a long and storied history. You will allow me, please, to tell you of that history. Ascent. I was travelling back from Constantinople, and had fallen in step with a gentleman by the peculiar name of Quesnel. Curiously enough, we had crossed paths a number of times, and so, somewhere ne near Andriopol, decided to plough our onward furrow in tandem. He was a learned man, though taciturn, and I found him fine company, with but one curious idiosyncrasy, he absolutely refused ever to dine with me. One night, somewhere in Bohemia, I lay awake reading from the Sefer Yetzirah when an unusual feeling rushed over me, chilling me to my bones and filling me with a dreadful foreboding, a feeling, nay, a conviction that something was amiss, that some dark force was here with us in the village and wanted us gone. Go and check on your companion. I arose, threw a robe around me, and made my way to Quesnel's room. I brashly threw open his door, only to reveal the room to be empty, with his bed still unrumpled. I heard a sound behind me and turned to see the innkeeper on the stairs shielding a guttering tallow candle with his hand. In halting English, he made clear that we were no longer welcome, and ushered me out into the cold night find somewhere to sleep. It was late and a soft rain had started to fall, so I thought only of finding somewhere dry and preferably warm to sleep. The village was small and the windows all shuttered, and my only option it seemed was to make use of the straw in a small half tumble down barn, which was at least dry. I soon fell into a deep and dreamless sleep. Continue. It must have been about three o'clock when I was jerked awake by a powerful instinct. Standing over me was Quesnel, wrapped in a dark cloak and haloed through the broken boards of the roof by the full moon. Alan, why are you sleeping in this barn? Bleary with sleep, I stumbled over my words. He interrupted me. Never mind, I have somewhere much more comfortable for us. He scooped me up into his arms as if I were no heavier than a newborn babe and carried me out into the night. It is but a short walk away. While we walk, I shall tell you a curious tale. When Austin, a local boy, disappeared after going to play near the pale stone, his disappearance was attributed to the fairies. Oh dear, something went wrong there. The Pale Stone is an ancient monument known as a place of power to be wary of, or maybe even a doorway into another realm, just out of reach. The fairies were known to be able to travel through this doorway and to be fond of kidnapping a little boys, enchanting them and leading them out of this world. That the fairies were responsible for Austin's disappearance was a theory given credence by the fact that he had been garbed in a new tunic of forest green, a colour known to be particularly alluring to the fairy folk. But when a man claiming to be Austin turned up almost 20 years later, he told a very different story. He still remembered, he said, the day of his disappearance. He had been playing near the brook and his clothes had become wet. He had removed his tunic and laid it upon the pale stone in the bright sunlight that it might dry quickly. It was not a cold day, and he was quite comfortable even without his tunic. 
He played a while longer, but soon became sleepy and lay on the ground to take a nap. When he awoke, it was darkest night, and he was frozen. He slipped his tunic on again and noted that it felt strange against his skin, like it wasn't his after all. But he put this from his mind and sped towards his village. When he arrived at the family cottage, there was no one home. He searched the village high and low, but not a soul was home. The whole town had vanished. Just as he was losing all hope, he saw a man he didn't recognise crossing the village square. He called out, the man turned, saw him and gave a shout. Suddenly two other men leapt from the shadows and threw a sack over him. He was bound head to foot with ropes, hauled over a shoulder and thrown on a cart which, lur which lurched off in an unknown direction. He felt every rut and bump of the road in his bones as the cart trundled and shook along mile after mile of road. The next time he saw light, it was a circle of sky far above him and he was surrounded on all four sides by walls. A great deal of time passed. The following years he spent in captivity and slavery, working hard for a series of cruel masters, each of whom treated him as nothing more than a beast of burden. Eventually, though, he had effected his escape and trudged many scores of miles in search of his home. Now the question of whether his tale was to be believed or not vexed the villagers. The man who called himself Austin was much changed, appearing old beyond his years, haggard and weary, and while some said they recognised the boy and the man, others declared that they did not. But nevertheless, his family did accept him as their own, and he lived out the rest of his years in the village of his birth, tending the goats as he had learned to do as a child. His remaining years were not so many in number, though, and when he died, of what the doctors believed to be exhaustion, there was found amongst his meagre possessions a small wooden box with, inside it, a small magical stone, unlike any stone found in this world. And with it, on a scrap of vellum, a short account which could not have been written by him, for Austin had never learnt his letters. Everything grows dim, hazy. You emerge as if from a cloud of steam into a whiteness. Before you, a mirror. But the face it portrays, is it yours? Something is wrong. This isn't you. This is not what you look like. face before you changes rapidly, uncertainly. The face before you grows clear, transparent, disappears. You aren't there in the mirror. I was just a lass on my first voyage and had spent the six and had spent the past six months at sea. I was eager to feel solid land beneath my feet, and so was delighted when we put in at some murky foreign shore, a dank coastline where the writhing jungle reached almost to the waves. We were in need of fresh water, and if we could find it, fresh food and I considered myself fortunate to be chosen as part of a little expedition tasked with procuring provisions. We set off, an officer, six men and I, into the jungle. And that place, it is one of the strangest I have ever known. There is an overabundance there, a cruel and natural and unnatural fecundity.
We slashed our way into the darkness, the sweat rolling down us and the fear building in our hearts. We did not know if these lands, if these were lands roamed by unspeakable savages, haunted by ghosts or guarded by ferocious beasts, but our instincts told us to be on the lookout for all three onwards. Well, the jungle has a strange effect on the mind of a person, and before long our party was bickering like a flock of old crones. None of us had faith that our commander was following a worthwhile course, and we fell to arguing about which way to go. A commander indicating one point of the compass, and the three of the men preferring another. Myself, I could see merit in neither, but the gauntlet was down. Side with the men. The weight of numbers persuaded me. I traipsed after the mutinous men while our commander marched in the opposite direction, cursing us with his every stride. Our unhappy little band stumbled through the jungle for hours, still searching for food before chancing upon a sort of pig-like creature crashing through the undergrowth. We pursued it, excited by the prospect of fresh meat, for some distance before emerging into a small clearing with a standing stone in its centre. Stand in awe. That stone must have been erected by people, and so it put the fear of God into us, for who knew what strange rites might be performed here? But that fear was not enough to drive the pig from our minds, and one of the men seized an opportunity and drove his cutlass straight through the beast, which was standing, snorting before the stone. It was killed in an instant. With one eye on the stone, the men set about felling a small tree to use as a pole and fetch down creepers with which to truss it up, that we might transport it back to the beach. And meanwhile, I slowly, with trepidation, approached the stone, which stood in a solitary pool of light. I felt in my heart that it was not man who had placed the stone here, nor was it some savage. I crouched down beside it and noticed a series of much smaller rocks arrayed on the ground in a ring around it. Reach out. I touched one of these rocks delicately with the palm of my hand, and suddenly I felt that I were just a babe again rocked on my dear mother's knee, and my sisters were there, chatting excitedly around the fireplace. And then I was a little older, riding on the back of a cart, biting, biting into a juice-laden pear. And then, what, I was someone completely different. I was, I'm ashamed to admit, a man, older, an explorer, climbing a mountain, gripping sharp stones with my hands. I was an older woman, richly dressed, listening to my husband warn me of a great danger. And then I was jerked out of these visions by a shout, and a hand clapped on my shoulder. It was one of the men. You don't want to mess with that. Come on, let's get going. Get up and go. As I made to rise, I saw at my feet, just next to the rock I had been touching, a small glinting object little flint or fossil or shard of something, and I scooped it up. As I did so, yet another memory rushed over me, not my own, but just as vivid as if it were. Hard times strike us all, and when I found myself without the income to pay off certain debts, debts that were hanging over me, I took to drink. I found solace in the bottom of a bottle. There is much comfort to be found in drink, and there was a short period when I believe I was the most content I have ever been. I was not an antisocial drinker, and there was a small tavern on the docks where I would often wind up of an evening, for the swill was cheap and not utterly abominable. One night I was drowning my sorrows when a sailor walked in and demanded a bottle. He was tall and thin and looked as though he carried the weight of the world on his shoulders. He scanned the smoke-filled room until his gaze alighted on my table. I was not the only one there drinking alone that night, and I know not why he settled on me. Perhaps he sensed some distant kinship, 
but for whatever reason, he uncorked his bottle, lurched towards me, and without a word, settled himself balletically onto the stool across from me. Regard him. Up close I could see that his pallor was ashen, and his whole demeanour told a story of grave misfortune. He nodded at me, but remained silent as he drained his bottle. And then, unbidden, he started up his story. It were a doomed voyage, and the first mate warned me, no good would come of it. We sailed out of one storm and into another, and when finally we made land, a, th a third of the crew deserted. He returned to the bar and came back with a pair of bottles, one of which he set in front of me. When he showed no intention of continuing his story, I asked him to which voyage he had referred, and he directed a look of pity at me. That I'll never tell, I've had enough of talk. And then he reached inside his coat and extracted a crumpled sheet of paper, which he slid across the table to me. I picked it up and began to read. It is day 39. The weather has cleared somewhat, but the snow is still deep. The deepest it's been, and our already slow pace has become a tortuous crawl forward, marking off each inch we progress. Another inch. Our destination is still, I realise, so far as to be completely out of reach. I have not spoken of this to the men. They must know, though, in their hearts. Another. One by one, our strength gives out, and we sink to our knees, sink into the harsh snow. I am not the last to fall. And the snow, it accepts us, it is not so harsh after all. I accept its embrace, I welcome its warmth. I am grateful that, unlike Moses, I have not been taunted with a glimpse of what was promised. I may not be going, but it matters not, for I know that others follow in my tracks. Darling? That's it. You finished reading the letter. On the couch, Septimus snores softly. Outside, the wind appears to have settled, and the magnolia, bathed in the strong light of the full moon, is resplendent in its silver-threaded garb. You look down at the page in front of you. It is stained, discoloured, but otherwise blank. You think back on the story, and on its ending in snow and ice. Yes, that felt like an end, but what was the beginning? Think back further. You cast your mind back over the snow and ice, over the slave boy in the tunic, the dank crypt, the mad, dank jungle, all the way back to the writer who disappeared. And so what happened there? What happened to all of these people in all of these tales? You realize that none of them have been resolved. No thread has been hitched. And the snow and ice? Where did that begin? You have no idea at all. As you ponder all this, Septimus stirs behind you and mumbles something you can't make out. Go over to him. You rise and step over the divan where Septimus slumbers. His sleep, it seems, is far from tranquil. There is a sheen over his skin and his muttering is intensifying. Try to listen. You bend your ear to his lips. You think you can make out something, fragments of phrases. It rustles the barn, unclosed the boy. Collapse. Soothe him. You press your cool hand to his brow, expecting to find it feverish, but his skin is as icy as yours. You whisper sweetly to him. Be calm, my dear. Be still. But rather than soothing him, your voice seems to have the opposite effect, and the darkness of his dream grows deeper. His hands ball into fists and his lips draw back 
into a snarl. Startled, you draw back a little, and at that his eyes snap open, fix you in their gaze, and he speaks with a voice unlike any you've heard before. Listen, but they are unfinished. All these words, they haven't formed yet a circle. It is not now time for us. And with that he falls silent again, rises from the divan, his eyes closed again, and with purpose pulls down a book and begins violently turning its pages. Before reaching the end, he tosses the book aside, crosses the room, and takes another book from a different shelf. Stop him. You cry out, stop, Septimus, for the love of God, stop. He stops, looks at you, says no. He throws his book to the floor, pulls down another one takes down another, takes another one. And so, yeah, that's the end. Um, this is the first time I've played through the whole thing since finishing and releasing the game, I guess, so... Um, I spotted a fair few typos and mistakes there. Um, I guess, you know, I knew that it wasn't um, it wasn't totally polished. I, d I didn't have time to really go over it with a fine toothed comb. Uh, but I guess I have to go back and like proofread it again uh, more intently this time. Um, there are a few also little glitches with the way that the portraits and things changed. I honestly thought that I'd fixed all of those. And so the the story with the, with the boy or at the beginning, weird things happen with the portrait on the right. And then it ends up kind of messed up. And then at the end, the woman and the man, the male and female images were inverted. Um, I don't know what's going on there. Um, but anyway, uh, I shouldn't really talk about all this stuff there. Um, thanks for watching this video, and I hope that uh, you enjoyed listening to me read my game, and uh, I hope you'll have a play. Um, thank you very much for watching. Goodbye.